Good morning, Toronto City Church. Welcome to our online worship experience. My name is Jessica, and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. We're going to go into a time of worship, and Pastor Brendan will be bringing the word. So grab the family, and let's worship together.
So God, I just thank you for this amazing time of worship that we've had. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying um, as we listen to the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back once again for another Sunday here at Toronto City Church in our online worship experience. I'm so thankful for our worship ministry, the way they continue to press forward and lead us into the presence of God. And I'm so thankful for each one of you as you continue to tune in and be connected with what God's doing here. Whether you're from the GTA or whether you're from another nation within the world, we believe God has you watching this with a reason and a purpose today. And so we're just thankful that you are here with us. If you are a guest with us, if you are joining us today, I want to make sure to give you an extra special welcome and just say thank you for joining us here at Toronto City Church. Again, whether this is during the premiere or maybe you've stumbled on this sermon at another point or this service at another point uh, in time, we are so thankful that you're here. And what we want to ask and encourage you to do is if you are a guest with us, make sure to go down in below this video on YouTube and connect on the link that talks about a connect card because we would love to connect with you. We would love just to be able to say thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, we'd want to pray with you on those. We're so thankful you're here with us. Something else that we are starting to focus in on as well is we recognize that now that we're doing things via an online worship experience, literally people from around the world can be connecting with us. And we know that some of you watching are watching from other areas of the nation or you are watching from other nations. And so what we wanted to mention is if you feel in your heart that God is calling you to get more connected with Toronto City Church, maybe to become an e-member, if you could say that, get in that connect card as well. Fill it out, let us know. Because we've got some ideas we're working on some ways that we can connect you in even more to what God's doing here at Toronto State Church, and we would love to have that conversation with you. So please, click on that link. Let us know that that's something that's on your heart. One of our team members will be glad to have a further conversation with you. Well, it is time for us to move into our time of giving today. And so we are so excited, as always, to give, to invest, to sow into the kingdom of God. Now, I know since we're giving online, many of us don't give at this actual moment, but you have your personal rhythm throughout the week when you give and when you submit your tithes and offerings. But I still want to encourage everyone, whether that is the case or whether maybe you are going to go right now and hit that button to go and give. I want to encourage you once again in the power of faithfulness and the power of honoring God with our finances. You know, it is so key and so important. Honor is such an important concept in the kingdom of God. There's part of my message today where I'm going to be talking a little bit more about honor and the importance of honoring God in this season, the importance of the fear of the Lord. And there's such a huge part of our giving to God that has to do with honor. There is such a huge part of a giving to God that has to do with a heart that says, God, I love you, and God, I honor you. I honor you with my obedience. I honor you with my faithfulness. I honor you with returning my tithes and my offerings. And so what I want to encourage you to do is I actually want to encourage you right now, whether you're giving at another moment, whether you're giving right now, let's take a moment. Let's literally take about 15 or 20 seconds of silence before God. Let's just wait on him for a few moments here and let's make sure we are posturing our hearts as we give to say, God, we honor you. That we're posturing our heart to say we're doing this not just to get something. We're not doing this just because we have to, but we truly want to give with a heart of honor. Because as you know, the word says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And I can promise you that someone gives with a heart to honor God, that touches his heart, that speaks to him, that blesses him. And so let's do that. Let's take a moment, like 15 seconds, and just wherever you are, let's have a moment of silence before God. And let's just make sure that we are posturing our heart to honor our giving. Amen? All right, let's start that right now. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you today for this honor we have to give. And, Lord, it's an honor to give. And today we want to make sure that we're giving with a heart of honor. 
And so I thank you for every person, God, who tithes, who gives, who sows so faithfully, God. Lord, for people who are just maybe starting to embrace this. God, maybe people, others who've done this for years, we want to make sure we have a heart of honor. And so we just turn our hearts to you today as we're in this giving moment, and we turn our hearts to honor. Show us any area of our hearts where there's not a spirit of honor because we want to have this heart of honor towards you. In Jesus' name. And everyone agreed, said, amen. Well, as always, the giving instructions are there for you just below this YouTube video, and you can find out how to give. As always, contact us and reach out to us if there's any challenges or if you need any help. But we are going to go to our weekly announcements, and then I'm going to be back with the word. See you in a moment. Well, hey everyone, we are back again for another week in the Word of God. I love the Word of God. I love reading the Word of God. I love studying the Word of God. I love praying the Word of God. And I love preaching the Word of God. And I'm excited today to bring the Word of God to you. And I'm excited today because we are actually starting a new sermon series today that's going to run for the rest of the summer. And this series is entitled, Stay in the Tent. I want you right now where you are. Just say out loud, stay in the tent. Amen? All right, well, let me just pray, and then we're going to dive into things. Father, we thank you today for this honor that we have to go to your word. Lord, I thank you that your word is life. God, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Lord, I thank you today that you are going to speak to us through your word. Father, I thank you that as we hear your word today, something is awakening in us in a fresh way, particularly as it comes to your presence, particularly as it comes to hungering and thirsting for you. And so I speak that and I declare that right now over every person that's listening, Father, to this webcast, that there is an awakening of hunger for your presence that is happening in their hearts and in their lives today as we dive into this together. And so we love you, Lord, and we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed, said, amen. All right, so stay in the tent. I am so excited to start this new series. I really do believe it is going to connect very much into our previous series, which was Pioneer. But before we start with our first verse today, I actually have just a little pastoral conversation I want to have with you as a church family. This is something that has been stirring in my heart over the last several weeks, and it was something that really stirred in my heart as I was preparing to deliver this message to you today. And it's simply this. As your pastor, I want to caution every member of this church family, and really any believer who is listening to this, because this COVID-19 season is literally affecting Christians around the globe. But I just have a caution or a check in my heart that I want to bring to you about a strategy the enemy would have to get us into isolation and for the need for us to not fall into the trap of isolation in this season. Let me explain to you what I mean by this. You know, if you think about it, for the last several months, for the first time in our lives, we have had a legitimate reason for not gathering together as believers. I mean, if you think about it historically, when was there another time in history when churches were really shut down, at least in a physical sense, for this long. I remember I was talking to a pastoral friend of mine, and he was just mentioning how he was talking about how such a crazy season. He thought, you know, probably the next craziest season like this was during the Second World War. 
he said, and so I mentioned my mom. I said, oh, well, it must have been like this. And she said, no, no, it wasn't like this at all. She said, we still went to church. We still went about our business. We were still gathering, connecting. And it was just reminding him of how unique this season has been. I mean, really, at least in a Canadian context, if you want to go back, you probably have to go back to the Spanish flu that was in the late 19s into the early 1920s to have something like this that has happened. And so really and truly, as we've been saying in many ways, this season has brought us into new territory. But there has been legitimate reasons for us not to gather together with other believers. Now, what's happening in the middle of this, and this is where the caution comes in, is obviously we have moved to an online format. We have still been working to connect in small groups, our connections. We've had classes. There's been lots of other ways we've been working to connect. But for many of us, our core foundation of connecting, which is coming together on a Sunday, has not been there the way it's been before. Furthermore, there actually was a study done by Barno, which is a Christian research group. This is referring to the States, but I'm sure it applies to Canada just as much. And they actually said that 40% of church, 48% of churchgoers say that they have not even watched any church online in the last four weeks. And so beyond even going, there was a lot of concern actually when this study came out among a lot of pastors, a lot of leaders, a lot of believers. Because not only were we not gathering together, but even the efforts to connect in these types of contexts, 48% of church goers said they weren't even watching. They hadn't watched in the last 48, or excuse me, the last four weeks. Now I know that this stat obviously would not apply to Toronto City Church. Because I'm sure all of us have been watching faithfully every single week, right? Well, anyways, you know what I'm saying, right? And so, hey, if there's a little bit of conviction in that, there's a little bit of conviction. But here's what I really want to challenge us with. This isn't the main point of my message, but I want to take a little bit of time for this pastoral conversation. We need to understand that what the enemy wants to do in this season is he wants to take advantage of these times to draw us away into isolation and to stop us from connecting with our spiritual family, to stop us from being connected to one another so that he can take us out. You know, in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, it says this, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. You know, this is a very sobering picture for us, isn't it? The enemy is prowling around and he's looking for someone to devour. He's looking for an opening. He's looking for someone who's going to give him a foothold, who's going to give him a space. He is looking for someone to devour. Uh, you know, in Hebrews 10.25 it says this, And not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right? And this is a verse I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Peter, or excuse me, the author of Hebrews is encouraging that we not neglect meeting together. But as we come together, we encourage one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. Now, could it be that God meant don't neglect to get, meet together, don't neglect connecting together, even in seasons like COVID? Right? Like I don't see a little footnote in my Bible that says, do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some. And remember, connecting is talking virtually. It's not just talking physically and encouraging one another and urging one another on. And then there's a little asterisk that says, well, unless you're in a, a pandemic in COVID-19. No, no. God is saying this is his word to us, guys. But what the enemy wants to do is he wants to in this season, even as we're coming into the fall, and even as we continue to push forward in what they're calling stage three, he wants to continue to work to get us just little by little moved out into isolation. And so my question, my challenge for you today, before I jump into the main portion of my message, is has he been working that strategy on you? And is it working? Are you allowing yourself? Because obviously, the enemy is crafty. He's not going to show up you know, I'm the devil with this big sign that says, I'm getting ready to deceive you. No, he comes in slowly. He's like a prowling lion, looking, sneaking, looking for his moments and looking for his opportunity. And so I want to encourage you, do not give him space to do that. You know, the Passion Translation says it this way. This is not the time to pull away or to neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. Because we need each other. 
In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate the day dawning. You know, it's interesting, the word abandon here, there's actually a subnote in the Passion Translation. It says, the Greek implies a person who is extremely discouraged. In other words, the enemy wants to hit us with discouragement. The enemy wants to trap us into isolation. And what he wants to do, so that was so powerful, is to get us into the habit of starting to neglect. To get us into the habit of not prioritizing connecting. You know, even something as, sim- uh, something as simple as watching the weekly webcast, right? It's so easy to start going, well, I'll get to it sometime. I'll watch it later in the week. You know, it's just me. It doesn't really make that big of a difference. And what are we starting to do? We're neglecting connecting. Yo, even with the Friday evenings as we're gathering together as a church family and as we're coming together to worship and pray. Listen, it's one thing if there's someone who says, listen, because of my work or because of some health challenges, I just don't feel a peace about going. I'm going to stay online. Hey, we trust you to sense God in that. But it's a whole other thing if someone's just like, well, I just don't really feel like going. I'm going to parties. I'm going out and hanging out with people. I'm going to do a bunch of stuff, but I'm neglecting coming together with the the people of God. And I'm preaching a little strongly on this one, but I want to challenge you that if you are falling into that trap, that is a deception of the enemy because he wants to get us isolated. Why? Because the prowling lion always attacks the gazelle or the sheep or the the goat or whatever who's become isolated from the flock. There is protection in the flock. There is protection as we gather together. There is protection in community. A couple weeks ago, we talked about pioneering in community. And so I just want to give you this pastoral encouragement today. Just as the author of Hebrews said here, this is not the time to pull away. Family, I want to say that again. This is not the time to pull away. This is not the time to neglect meeting together. The enemy wants to get you into a habit of neglecting coming together with other believers. Do not let it happen. Why? Because we need each other. And in this season, it's even saying we should come together even more frequently. Why? Because we need to encourage each other. And we need to urge each other onward. Why? Because we are anticipating the day dawning. What is he talking about when he says the day? He is talking about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've been having a wonderful time in this season. One of the courses we did this summer was Understand the End Times. And we've been talking about eschatology. We've been talking about what the Bible teaches about the end times. And one of the things, we've actually been focusing on different viewpoints and digging into them and comparing them. But here's one of the key themes that no matter what your eschatological position is you need to understand is that Jesus is coming back and that Jesus could be coming back any single day and that Bible is very clear it says no man knows the day or the hour so we always need to be ready and we always need to be expecting his return and when we live in light of his return when we live in light of the fact that we're going to stand before him judgment it shapes the way we live our lives and I promise you, it pushes us away from apathy. It pushes us away from being lukewarm. And it causes us to prioritize the things of God. I'm going to get off this point and move into my message. But here's my last challenge. Are you, am I, are we prioritizing the things of God in this season? Or are we falling into a habit of neglect? If you see in your heart any area where you have fallen into the habit of neglect, repent today. Get it right with God. Make a conscious and quality decision that I'm going to prioritize the things of God in this season. I'm going to prioritize my personal walk, but I'm also going to prioritize my corporate walk. I'm going to prioritize being together with my family in Jesus' name. I'm going to prioritize the weekly words and watching this online. I'm going to prioritize connection. I'm going to prioritize being involved in prayer. I'm going to prioritize, even as we come into the fall, I am going to prioritize the things of God and be being with the people of God. Why? Because it is so key. If there was ever a time we needed to be running together, family, this is the time. And so if you see in your heart there's any area that you have begun to neglect, make a choice to change today. Amen? Amen. Let's make that choice. Let's make that change. And now let's jump into the main portion of our message, which is simply this. Again, I want to talk to you about staying in the tent. Somebody say that again right where you are. Say, stay in the tent. Let's go to Exodus 33, 7 to 11. This will be our core text for this series. And it says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. 
And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And all the people who saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his door. Thus the Lord would use to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And when Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Somebody say it again. Stay in the tent. We see here it says, Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent, but he would stay in the tent. Come on, somebody say it again. Stay in the tent. You know what, this verse has always been a verse that has, has uh, captured my heart. I don't remember the first time I read it. I don't remember the first time I heard it. But I remember for many years now, even I suspect from in my teenage years, that I was aware of this verse. And this verse really spoke to me. And it really impacted my heart, this heart, even as I was a young man in those times and seasons. I still consider myself a somewhat young man now. But I definitely was a young man in those times and seasons. This call and this passion to stay in the tent. And really, when we expand that out a little bit, and it's really going to be the heart of this message, it's having a heart for the presence of God. It's having a heart to be with God. It's having a heart to walk with Him like Enoch walked with Him. To have a heart like Moses where he said, God, show me your glory. To have a heart for the presence of God. You know, just sharing with you a little bit about my journey. I don't remember the first time that I really encountered the presence of God distinctly. But I do remember one season of my life where I know I became so aware of the presence of God. And it, when it was still, a, I was still a, a child, uh, probably between the ages of 10 and 13, my parents used to send me to this boys' camp. And it was this boys' camp in the summer, and it was a wonderful camp. We would go out there. It wasn't very big. It was quite small. It was actually just a pastor and like kind of a local country church. I don't know how my, my parents found it. But, but they do this boys' camp because they felt like 10 to 13 was very formative time for boys. And so we get together. We do a bunch of fun stuff. We do a bunch of adventurous stuff. But they really led us into understanding the presence of God. I remember, I think that was the first place I really learned to worship. I remember they talked to us about what it really means to be a man of God. They would talk to us about what the Bible teaches us about being a man. I mean, it was such a formative and impacting time for me. And I don't remember, why. Well, I do remember one specific instance I'm going to mention to you, but I do remember being in that camp and being touched and impacted by the presence of God. And it lit something in my heart, even as a child, even as a preteen going into my teenage years, it lit inside of me a hunger for God's presence. I'll always remember one day, because they teach us to do devotions, and they teach us to go spend personal time with God, which is huge and is so important. I remember one day going out to do my devotional time, and I don't remember what psalm it was, but I was reading this psalm where it just talked about God loving me as a son. And in that moment, the Lord gave me a picture of my father and just something in, uh, in my life where my dad was a great dad. And, and it really centered actually around my soccer games because my brother was a very high-level soccer player. He played at the highest level in the province. Me, not so much. I actually was not very good at all. And, uh, but my, I, I saw this picture of how my dad still would come and cheer me on. And it suddenly dawned on me in that moment. It's amazing how God will just speak to you through circumstances in your life. You know, I read about the love of God. I read about his love as a father. And then I saw this picture of my father cheering me on. And I realized he's not cheering me on because I'm good. Because I wasn't good. But I realized he's cheering me on because he loves me. And I suddenly made the jump in my heart. It was a moment of revelation where I thought, that's how God loves me. He doesn't love me because I'm good or because I do things really well. He loves me because I'm his son. And I remember in that moment, I was so overcome by the presence of God. I can still see it now. I'm sitting out in this rock, kind of overlooking the hill down to the parking lot. And tears just began to pour down my face. And I had an encounter with the love of God. I didn't have the language for it then. Now I would talk about the father heart and encountering the love of God. I didn't know all that back then. All I knew was I had this revelation that God loved me. 
And his presence was so real to me in that moment. I knew that I knew that I knew he loved me. And from that day forward for my entire life, I have never doubted the love of God. I've always had my, chal- I've had my challenges. I've had my moments, but I never doubted the love of God. Why? Because of an encounter in his presence. Right? I, I'm going on. I remember growing up a little further. I was very blessed to be involved in a youth ministry at our church, uh, Christian Life Center. Some of you were connected in some ways to that as well throughout our history. And we had an amazing youth group that just really experienced the move of God. We'd be there on Wednesday nights. We'd have 150 young people there. And it was not like pizza parties and games. It was, let's seek God. We'd really got in touch by what was happening out of Airport Christian Fellowship. We got in touch by what was happening out of Brownsville. And there was a real spirit of revival. Kids were getting saved. We would just worship God. There would just be, we'd have great preaching of the Word of God. And I remember times being there till 11 or midnight. I remember one Wednesday night, God was just moving. God's friends, because we'd just stay at the altar. We just wait before God, even as teenagers. We were hungry for God. I remember one night, God's presence was so strong. Some kids couldn't even walk out. Their parents literally had to come in and pick them up and carry them out to the car to take them home. And so being in this youth ministry, and I'm so thankful for even our youth pastors of those days, Pastor Dan and Pastor Mark, because they led us into pursuing the presence of God. Was it a perfect youth group? No. But there was this hunger for the presence of God, and it marked me. It marked me. It wasn't just religion. It wasn't just theology. And I'm not against theology at all. You know, we love theology. But we were encountering the presence of God. We were in the tent. I remember going on a little further, and even in the early days of when I planted a church, there was a ministry called Tehillah Toronto. Some of you, again, were there at Tehillah as well. On a Monday night, there would be as many as 700 to 800 young adults at some times gathered together just to worship God and to seek God. And it was all about worshiping Him. I mean, the worship movement there was incredible. Some of you know Laura Woodley Osmond, who's an amazing worship leader. She was one of the core worship leaders there. There were others who plugged in. Pastor Huey Watkins. So many great relationships those days. But one of the things that would mark us was just the worship and the seeking the presence of God. The times at being at the altars before God. It marked me. And it bled over because I just planted a church. And that started to move over into our church at Church Without Limits. I remember we went through a season at Church Without Limits. We do these Saturday night services whole bunch of young people packed into this old Anglican church up on a hill. Some of you remember very well. We'd start our service at 7 o'clock, and sometimes we'd worship for a couple hours. We'd just worship God. Then we'd preach. We'd work wild and crazy. We'd preach, and then we'd just stay, and we would seek God. I mean, sometimes we would be there till past midnight, just waiting on God, being in the presence of God. Parents would not believe that their kids would come to church. They're like, no way you went to church. There's no way you're staying that long at church. There's no way you're doing that. And then we tear up all the equipment, pack it up, and then we go over to Eastside Mario's and eat wings till 4 o'clock in the morning. I was much younger in those days. I could not even survive that kind of schedule today. But what marked me, what marked us, what there was, and this is part of our DNA, even at Toronto City Church, because I know even historical stories about Toronto City Church, where the presence of God would rest so strong, where there'd be Friday night prayer meetings where the building is packed, praying for revival, praying for the city. It's in the DNA of our churches, people being in the tent, staying in the tent, seeking the presence of God. You Even when I think about encounter weekends and just what I've watched God do as we got into places for His presence to impact our lives, where we got into places to encounter Him. You know, why am I sharing all this? Because I, I, I'm sharing with you about my journey. I'm sharing with you a little bit about what has forged me and what has formed me. Because I want you to know today that the, the man who stands before you, even on this screen, the pastor who is leading all that I have, it, it, it was forged who I am, what I have, what I'm all about. As I go back through my life, it was sparked and it was forged in times in the presence of God. It was sparked and it was forged in times of being in the tent before God and being in His presence. And in the middle of all this family, I want to encourage you today And I want to encourage you in in, in the call for us, even in this season, the call for us in this time, to be in that tent before God. You know, I remember when I was in my early 20s, and I'd just been pastoring for a couple years, I got invited to go to a meeting that I actually really had no business being at. It was a meeting, like apostolic meeting, all these leaders from around the world. I mean, if I started naming off names, you would know most of the names who were there. And I'm sitting there going, how in the world did I get in here? 
But, uh, and some of you have heard me tell this story before, but they had a panel for young leaders under 35 at the time. They were much older than me because I was under 25, I think, at the time. But, but there, was, uh, there was this panel, and all were sharing. And to make a long story short, there was one of the men on that panel who was sharing. His name was uh, Pastor Jackson Sianga. He actually was in the first transformation video. He pastored a church in Uganda. They went from like 20 to 2,000 people in two weeks. And he was talking about the move of God and what God was doing. And I remember I was so marked by what he said. It was like everyone who shared was good, but he was just on another level. And it wasn't because he was more eloquent. It wasn't because he was more funny. It was because when he spoke, there was just this presence of God that he carried. And I remember I, I went up to him afterwards once he coughed the stage, and I just said to him, I said, can you please pray for me? I said, I want to know, how do I get what you have? And I remember before he prayed at me, he looked at me, he said, this is what you need. He said, Psalm 27, Psalm 63, Psalm 84. And these are all psalms about being hungry for the presence of God. These are all psalms about being hungry to know God, seeking God. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than live in mansions with the wicked. Uh, you know, my soul thirsts for you. My soul longs for you like in a weary land where there is no water. You know, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. And he laid hands on me and he prayed for me. But I realized as I've reflected back, he was trying to help me understand that this was not just going to, what he carried and what he walked in did not just come because someone laid hands on you and prayed for you. Even though I'm not against laying on hands and impartation. But what he walked in when he said to me is because we pursued the presence of God. And we pursued the presence of God, not just for a day, not just for a week, not just for a month, but over seasons of times we have prioritized his presence. I just remember he said, in North America, he said, you're good at programs. He said, we're not so good at programs. He's talking about Uganda. He said, but we're good at prayer. We're good at seeking the presence of God. You know, and I would, I would like to say to you that ever since that prayer time with him, ever since he shared those things with me, I have just been perfect at going after the presence of God and perfect at the Psalms. But you know what I've learned over time? I've definitely had great moments along the way. But life wars against that. Busyness wars against that. Hurts and disappointments war against that. But there's this thing that we've got to have in our hearts there's this focus that we need to have that we say we are prioritizing the presence of God. We're thankful for our programs. We're thankful for our buildings. We are thankful for our strategies. We're thankful for our strategic planning. I'm not against any of these things. We're thankful for our lights. We're thankful for our technology. We're thankful for our, our creative ideas. But what is going to make the difference above all else is going to be the presence of God. What is going to make the difference is when men and women and church families say, we're going to the tent of meeting. We're erecting a tent. We're setting out a tent before God, and we are going to stay in the tent. And family, if I could just say this from my heart, in the middle of this season, you know, as we've been talking about where God's taken us, this is what he has been stirring in us. And he is calling us in a fresh way. I almost feel it's like the puzzle pieces could be coming together for us, even in the middle of this time. But will we be people who get in the tent? Will we be a church that prioritizes the presence of God? Will we be a church that prioritizes prayer? Will we be a church that prioritizes seeking Him? Will we be people like Joshua who will get in this tent and will stay in this tent? Why? Because family, let me encourage you. God is calling us to this tent. God is calling us to meet Him in the tent. And God is calling us to stay in the tent. Who will say yes? Who will be someone who will say, yes, God, I'm going to answer your call. I'm going to set up the tent. I'm going to be in the tent. And I'm talking figuratively. And I am going to stay in the tent. Family, in the days that are coming, we must be believers who prioritize the presence of God. Family, in the days that are coming, we need to be churches that prioritize the presence of God. I remember hearing a speaker say recently, and it impacted me. It just stuck with me. Because he was talking about the argument that sometimes happened. Well, is church for believers or is church for non-believers? When we come together, should it be you know, for Christians or should it be for not Christians? And he jumped in the middle of this. He said, no, it's for God. Right? And that just hit me. It's not for the believer. It's not for the non-believer. It's for him. 
We're coming together to worship Him, to honor Him, to seek Him. Why? Because when we do that, He shows up in manifested presence and He impacts the believer and He impacts the non-believer. We really need to gather and be centered around His presence. Will we be people of His presence? Will we be a church family of His presence? Will we be presence driven? Will we be those who stay in the tent? There's so many benefits of the presence of God that we could share about, guys. We could talk about the fact that in His presence, we have confidence and faith. In His presence, there is wisdom. In His presence, there is peace. In His presence, there is joy. In His presence, there is strength. In His presence, there is encouragement. In His presence, there is rest. In His presence, there is freedom. In His presence, there is protection. In His presence, there is deliverance. In His presence is the fruit of the Spirit. In His presence is the gifts of the Spirit. And we could go on and on and talk about the benefits of the presence, but here's why all those things are in His presence. Because when you get His presence, you get Him. And when you get Him, you get everything He has. You know, it's like that old saying that maybe some have made cliched, but hear the heart of it. It's not, let's, let's not just seek His hands, but let's seek His face. Because when you get His face, when you really seek Him, you get everything that's in His hands. But if all we're after is what He has in His hands, there's so much that we miss out on. Will we be those who stay in the tent? Will we be those who seek His face? This is my heart. This is my prayer. This is my passion. This is what I'm asking God that I will grow in. This is what I'm asking God that our church family will grow in. That even in this time, even this season, we will be those who stay in the tent. And so, in my last thought here, before we bring this to a close, we might be wondering, well, okay, how do I do that? How do I become someone who's prioritizing the presence of God? How do I become someone who's staying in the tent? How do we become a church family that is staying in the tent? And so let's go back to this chapter and this uh, several verses in Exodus chapter 33 because I believe there's wisdom and revelation for us in this. So let's look at verse 7. It says, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Now, several thoughts from this verse. If we're going to be people who stay in the tent, if we're going to be people who are presence-driven, the first thing we need to do is we need to be intentional about it. See, Moses intentionally went outside and set up a tent outside the camp. He was intentional about it. He was strategic about it. He knew what he was doing. So often, I think, we look at pursuing God's presence almost like a fluke. It's just like, well, I was just doing my thing, and it just happened. Right? Moses wasn't just doing his thing, and suddenly there was a meeting with God. No, he was intentional about making this his course. Will we be intentional about saying, I'm going to be someone who stays in the tent? Will we be intentional saying, we're a church that's going to stay in the tent? The second thing about this, which is interesting to me, was it says he would pitch it outside the camp, not in the middle of the camp. And it would be far off from the camp. If you are going to be someone, if we are going to be people who stay in the tent, people who prioritize the presence of God, we're going to have to be prepared at times to make a goal of it on our own. We're going to have to, make, we're going to, have to be prepared to leave the crowd, to leave maybe a bunch of people around us who just aren't there. And it doesn't mean we're rejecting them forever or rejecting them for life, but sometimes going after the presence of God is just something you've got to get out there and you've got to do it. You got to be prepared to move away maybe from what is kind of popular, what is kind of the common thing that everyone says. If you just follow the crowd, you will never be someone who stays in the tent. See, but if you're intentional like Moses and you go out there, you're intentional like Joshua, you say, God, even if I'm going alone, I'm seeking you. Maybe some of you are watching right now and you feel like you're the only one in your core circle relationships who's hungry for God. Pursue him anyways. Go after him anyways. Because that's the only hope that those around you really, the biggest hope they have is you're going after God and it draws them into going after Him. But even if you have to go alone, go after Him today. Even if no one is cheering you on, no one is encouraging you, some people around you think you're crazy for how hungry you're for God. Keep going to the tent. Keep staying in the tent. Why? Because with God's pleased with you, it doesn't matter what everybody or anybody else around you says. And the third thing I see in this part of the verse, it says, and everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting. See, they set their heart to seek God. Will we be people who set in our heart and say, God, I want to know you. God, I'm seeking 
you with all of my heart. That we would be people who seek him. Verse 8 says, And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. Now what stands out to me from this verse is stands out to me is the heart of honor that is needed. There's a very important truth and a very important principle here of people. If we're going to be people who stay in the tent, if we're going to be people who are really practicing the presence of God, we need to be people who honor the presence of God. You know, essentially the children of Israel, they wouldn't just go and keep eating. Oh, Moses, go out to tell me, okay. No, they would stand and they would rise, which was a sign of honor and respect. God's presence comes where he is honored and where he is reverenced. There is a fresh wave of the fear of the Lord, not being afraid of God, but having an awesome awe and reverence and respect for his presence. If we do not have a reverence for the presence of God, we will not be able to be in the presence of God for very long, because where he is not reverenced, he is not going to come in manifested power. And so we need to be people who learn to honor the presence of God and people who walk out this place of honor. Verse 9 says, And when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses. You know, it's interesting. Notice it said Moses would go to the tent, and then the presence of God would come. It wasn't the presence of God that would come and Moses would go. But God would respond to Moses. It kind of reminds me of what it says in James 4, verse 8. If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Now, obviously, we take a little step. God takes a big God-sized step, but he is still looking for people who draw near to him. When Moses would go, God would respond. See, so often we are waiting for God, and God is actually waiting for us. Right? We're just kind of, well, if God just wants to really impact me with his presence, I guess he'll just do it. No, who's going to be hungry? Who's going to be thirsty? Who's going to go to the tent themselves? You know, I love this too because it says, and he, the Lord would speak with Moses. You know one of the reasons why many of us don't go deeper in the presence of God? It's because we're talking too much and we're not listening enough. Right? When I'm seeking him, I'm not just there telling him what I think. I'm waiting on him. I'm listening to him. I'm pursuing him. Will we be people? If we're going to be people who stay in the tent, we've got to be those who will draw near to God. When's your time? When do you set aside time to go to the tent? And then do you just talk at God or do you actually listen to him? Because he wants to speak to you. He wants to speak to us. But he's looking for those like Samuel who will say, Speak, Lord. My servant, your servant is listening. Just a couple more things. Verse 10, it says here, When all the people saw the pillar of cloud stand at the entrance of the tent, all of them would rise up and worship each at his tent door. There is something about worship that leads us into the presence of God. You know, there's the verse that says, we will enter his gates with thanksgiving and we'll enter his courts with praise. That's talking about going in because that was a symbol of the temple. It's a picture of the temple, which was in that time where the presence of God were. Now it's in us and it's, it's, it's all over. But they said, we come in with thanksgiving and we come in with praise. There is something about praise and worship. See, these people would rise and they would worship. If you want to go deeper in the presence of God, grow as a man or woman of worship. Can I challenge you for a second watching today? If you're watching this and you struggle with worship, if you're watching this, you can't even raise your hands because you're worried about what people will think about you. If you're watching this, you always just do kind of the pocket praise shuffle. I want to challenge you to go deeper in worship. Why? Because God is so good and he's so awesome and he's so worth it and he so deserves it, but there's so much that he wants to lead you into on the other side of you becoming a worshiper. Will we be those who worship? And then last but not least in verse 11, it says, And thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. I believe, guys, that this is a season, first and foremost, he would speak to him face to face, a man speaks to his friend, to pursue friendship with God. Now, I'm not saying this in kind of like a light, jovial manner. I'm talking about a reverent, holy fear of God in our hearts, but still recognizing he's invited us to friendship with him. Who will seek out and say, God, I actually want to be a friend of you. I want to walk with you. I want to hear you. I don't just want what you can do for me. I'm going to look what I can do for you. Will we pursue presence of God? I believe this is a season for us to linger in the presence of God. Some of the most impacting times of my life, I can even think back to when I was a young person, and just be being at an altar 
and everybody else is leaving, going to have food, hang out, whatever. But I'm there. Why? Because I'm waiting in the tent. I'm lingering in the presence of God. This is not just a microwave, quick and easy solution, guys. It's about being touched and impacted by Him. And sometimes there's some things from God that come to those who wait. Will we be those who linger in the presence of God? And last but not least, I love this, because Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. He stayed in the tent. He stayed in the tent. He stayed in the tent. Now, when Joshua was staying in the tent, he didn't know that one day he was going to be called to lead the children of Israel. He didn't know that one day he was going to have to lead them across the Jordan River and watch the water stop as God works a miracle from the past. He didn't know that one day he was going to have to lead them around those walls of Jericho seven times and then declare, shout for the Lord is giving you the victory. He didn't know that one day that they were going to have the battle in eye where they were defeated and he had to know how to seek God to get the answer so they could get back on track. He didn't know that he was going to have to lead the children of Israel to and through the promised land. He didn't know all these things were coming. But he was hungry for God. He was hungry for his presence. And he was also being prepared in his presence. He didn't know what was coming. But he was faithful to be prepared. And you know, I find it very interesting when I study this. If you look in the scriptures, Moses actually had many elders. He had many tribal leaders, but when it came time to select the new leader of Israel, God did not look to one of the elders, but he looked to the man who served Moses, and he looked to the man who stayed in the tent. God's calling you into the tent. God's calling us into the tent this season. What is he preparing us for? You don't just go to the tent to prepare for something. You go to the tent because you love God. But in the middle of this, I want to encourage you, what is he getting us ready for? We don't see what's coming. But if we're with him, if we walk with him, if we stay in the tent, if we become a people of his presence, because we have him, we'll always be ready for whatever comes. Will we be men and women who stay in the tent? Will we be a church family who stay in the tent? I want to pray for you in just a moment for an awakening in our hearts, for us answering this call even in this season, even gathering on Friday nights to pray and worship. This is not just meant to be kind of like a nice summer fad. Guys, we are coming into a new season of prioritizing the presence of God. I don't know all he's going to do. I don't know all that it looks for, but here's what I know. We're going to get in the tent, and we're going to stay in the tent, and we're going to watch God do amazing things because we are in the tent. Will you join me in the tent? Because what I love about this is I did say earlier, sometimes you got to go at it alone. But there's something powerful being part of a church community where a bunch of us are going after it together. Will we be people of his presence? Will we be a church family's presence? Will we be those who stay in the tent? I want to pray for you right now. And if your heart is to join me and say, I want to be a man or woman who stays in the tent. I want us to be a church community, a church family that stays in the tent. I want you just to create like a place of prayer wherever you are right now front of your television, in front of your computer screen, in front of your phone, whatever. It's just get yourself in a posture. Get on your knees if you feel comfortable doing that. Raise your hands to the Lord if that works for you. Whatever it is, create a posture of prayer. And I'm going to pray for all of us that we will be people who stay in the tent. And so, Father, we come before you today in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for every person that's watching this message. Father, I pray for each one of us, myself included, that there will be a fresh awakening to hunger and thirst for you. Father, I pray, I declare, I prophesy a fresh awakening of a hunger for your presence. God, forgive us where we've been hungry for so many other things and we've not been hungry for you. And I pray there would just be this awakening in our hearts to be hungry and thirsty for you. Lord, that we would just have this heart and this passion for you in such a fresh way in this season. God, I pray that we'll be people who erect that tent. I pray we'll be people who go to that tent. And I pray that we will be people who stay in the tent. In Jesus' name. And everyone agreed with me, said, Amen. Now here's my encouragement this week. Don't let this just be a nice message that you don't actually go do something about. But make this week, prioritize this week about being 
with him, being in his presence. There's so many simple ways you can do that. Worship, reading your word, praying, being together with other believers, but prioritize his presence in your life. It's an amazing journey that will last for eternity, encountering and experiencing the presence of God. Now, just before we go, I do want to give one last opportunity. There's some people watching this webinar right now, and you are not right with God. God loves you, and he wants you to be right with him, but it's still your choice. The Bible teaches us that we've all sinned, myself included. We've all fallen short of God's standard. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again to deal with sin. And he said, I want to give you a free gift of salvation, but we still have to choose to receive it. You say, well, how do I receive that? Well, A, you admit you need it, you admit you're a sinner. B, you believe on Jesus. C, you confess your sins and you turn away from them and you run to him. And so I just want to pray with anyone watching right now. If you know you need to give your life to Christ. If you know you need to give your life back to Christ. I'm going to pray this. You pray it loud and strong where you are right now with me. And God will hear your prayer. And God will answer your prayer. Say this. Say, Jesus, thank you for your love for me. Thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you rose again. Today, I recognize my need of you. I turn my back on sin. I repent. I give my life to you. Fill me. Transform me. I want to follow you. In Jesus' name. Never agree with me, said. Amen. 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 Here's what I want to ask you. If you prayed that prayer in the information section for this video, you will find a link where you say, I gave my life to Christ. Please click on that link. Let us know that you prayed this prayer. Let us know you made this decision. We want to follow up with you. We want to back you up. We want to support you. Amen. All right. It's been awesome to be with you guys this week. Again, let's be those who stay in the tent. Let's be, so, be those who pursue God. I'm looking forward to seeing you even this coming Friday. We're going to continue to lean into this stuff together. We're going to continue to focus on the Psalms and our connections. We are pursuing Him together in Jesus' name. Amen? All right, God bless you. See you soon. Thank you so much for joining us for our online worship experience. Remember to click subscribe and the notification bell so you know when we upload new videos. Enjoy the rest of your day and see you next week.